Recording in progress. Well, good morning. Good morning. Hi, ready to go. Uh, well, good morning. Can you hear me now? Thank you all for joining us today, both in the room here and those who are joining us virtually. It took years of dedication 
passion, compassion, and the experts of many people throughout the world, U of L Health, the University of Louisville, scientists, researchers, nurses, and physicians from all across, across the globe to make this happen. Because of COVID, we had to limit who could be in the room. But if you're watching online, I want you to know, we appreciate you, your direct involvement, and your ongoing support to maintain safe COVID protocols with distancing, masks, and vaccines. I would particularly like to welcome our U of L Health Board Chairwoman, U of L President Neely Bendapudi. Dr. Mark Slaughter. Dr. Slaughter is the Surgical Director of Heart Transplant at U of L Health, Professor and Chair in the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at the U of L School of Medicine. And Dr. And Dr. Sid Powa. Dr. Powa is a cardiothoracic surgeon with the U of L Physicians and an assistant professor in the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery with the U of L School of Medicine. We'll be hearing from them in just a moment. I'd also like to acknowledge our CEO, Tom Miller, for his ongoing support of this program, Jewish Hospital and its continued efforts to make sure U of L Health is meeting the needs of our community, our commonwealth, and advancing medicine for people everywhere. And finally, U of L School of Medicine Dean Tony Ganzel for assembling and leading such an outstanding team of academic physicians and researchers. World first procedures are medical milestones worth celebrating. Jewish Hospital has long track record of making history particularly when it comes to the heart. In fact, preserving that history and investing in future advancements are key reasons our hospital is now part of the U of L Health. We had a, a partnership with the University of Louisville for decades, but the purchase of our hospital by U of L Health less than two years ago is now paying dividends in life-saving ways. That brings me to our milestone today. I'd like to invite Dr. Slaughter and Pawa up to share the great news. Uh, let me take my mask off. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John. It's a great opportunity to be here today. And uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough uh, the sort of gratitude uh, uh, that we uh, owe to U of L Health Administration, as well as the University uh, to Louisville to continue uh, uh, to allow us to be uh, world leaders in innovative heart failure research uh, and uh, surgery. Uh, we couldn't do it uh, without them. Uh, today, though, we're here to celebrate the implantation of the third ASON uh, total artificial heart uh, in the U.S. and the first time a woman has actually received this device in the world. Uh, last Tuesday, September 14th, along with Dr. Powell and our surgical team, uh, we implanted the ASON bioprosthetic total artificial heart into a 57-year-old woman uh, from Kentucky who is suffering from severe biventricular uh, heart failure uh, during an eight-hour surgery. The recipient, uh, whose identity is being withheld upon request, had previously undergone cardiac surgery, uh, but subsequently had deterioration and re was referred to our advanced heart failure uh, team here at uh, uh, University of Louisville and Jewish Hospital. She's recovering well in the cardiovascular intensive care unit here at Jewish Hospital, along with our first male patient, who is the second in the U.S. to be implanted with this device. This early feasibility study which is sponsored by the French company Carmat, is an investigational device that's currently intended to be used as bridge to transplantation. What makes the ASON total artificial heart different from traditional ventricular assist devices or left ventricular assist devices, which many of us have seen before, is that the ASON heart is able to be a replacement for both ventricles, the main pumping chambers of the heart. 
After years of development and research studies, some of which were performed here at the University of Louisville at the Cardiovascular Innovation Institute, our patient was able to receive this incredible and fascinating device. You all know we like being first, as John had mentioned, but this is not the first time that we've been the first here at Jewish Hospital and the University of Louisville. So for some of those in the audience who may not be familiar, I'd like to just quickly uh, mention a few. Uh, in 1984, uh, Dr. Gray was the first to do a heart transplant uh, in the state of Kentucky here at Jewish Hospital. In 2001, Dr. Gray implanted the first Abiocor total artificial heart here at Jewish Hospital. In 2011, we did the first transcatheter aortic valve replacement uh, at Jewish Hospital in the state of Kentucky. And in 2015, actually, we implanted the first HeartMate 3 left ventricular assist device. Uh, much of which the device development was also done here at the University of Louisville at the Cardiovascular Innovation Institute. Uh, but the first have not stopped there. In February of 2018, at the Traeger Heart Transplant, we performed our 500th heart transplant. And actually in 2021, we did our 1,000th catheter-based uh, aortic valve replacement, uh, quite an achievement. And then just last month, we did the second in the nation ASON total artificial heart by an incredible team, which leads me to what I'd like to introduce is some of our team members who have participated in this amazing event, because uh, it truly uh, is a, a team event. So uh, if here, and I know some of them are working, but I'd like you to come up and uh, join me uh, here. Uh, Dr. Robin Gilry is our director of our uh, cardiac surgery uh, intensive care unit. Dr. Dana Settles uh, is in charge of cardiac anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Moore uh, is our medical director of heart transplant and advanced uh, heart failure therapies. And I believe she is very busy because she told me <laughs> that many of our patients had to look after. Uh, Devin uh, Costell is our nurse practitioner who manages our transplant uh, patients. And uh, none of this can be done without a, uh, a first-rate, world-class uh, clinical research nurse, uh, Terry Blanton, who's been with us since I've been here. Terry, please come up. And uh, uh, Dominic uh, Capaletti and Jason Brown are biomedical support staff and perfusionists who help us with all our mechanical surgical support. And in the operating room, you can't perform operations uh, without first-class assistance, nursing support, uh, and uh, uh, scrub uh, personnel. So Benny Thornton, uh, Pharmaceutical Services, as Benny said, obviously fine. I always like to say there's a, a quote by uh, Alex Haley. It's a, when they see a turtle on a fence post and everyone's amazed at the turtle on the top, but everyone knows that turtle couldn't have gotten there without a lot of help. And uh, today I'm sort of the turtle on the fence post and this is the team that helped us get there. So I certainly want to thank uh, our amazing team uh, with these leaders and teams by our side, caring for our most critical patients. We've been able to save the lives of numerous uh, patients throughout the state and region. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my surgical partner and innovation, uh, innovator, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, Dr. Pawa. Dr. Pawa. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Slaughter. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to be able to work beside you every day and to, to do all the things that we do to innovate and push the boundaries of heart failure surgery ever higher. Um, and as we all know, it's a, it's a known fact that about three and a half thousand patients in the country are awaiting a heart transplant at each moment. Due to the paucity of donor heart availability, uh, we're unable to transplant most of them. So there is a constant need to innovate and push and, found, and find uh, heart transplant substitutes. Now, the left ventricular assist device was one such substitute, which, was, which has been approved all over these years and has done really well. 
Unfortunately, uh, as the name goes, it's a left ventricular device and it supports the left side of the heart. For patients with uh, biventricular failure, which is which is the more common lot, uh, it's not as effective. The ESON device that we've just implanted is designed to help patients with biventricular failure, and thus it opens up a wide spectrum of patients that we can help with it. Uh, a very uh, a unique aspect of this device or a peculiarity is that it has pressure sensors, uh, which uh, sense the amount of amount of uh, blood that the body needs and delivers that much cardiac output. Previous devices or older devices, you could adjust the, the amount of cardiac output needed, but this is unique in its own way. And it uh, again, it, it's, it's, it's a very positive uh, aspect of this device. The other thing as we've seen, and as we've uh, come to see over the couple, last couple of patients that we've done, this device is, is, uh, is very compact. Now it can be used in both men and women. Uh, there are uh, uh, there are no size limitations, or that there are less size limitations. Let's put it that way. So again, it opens up a wider aspect of or array of patients that uh, that will benefit from this device. Uh, the entire operation operative procedure takes about six to eight hours, but that's just one part of the patient's journey. As Dr. Stoddard has said, uh, the patient then spends days in the ICU and is looked after by intensivists, nurse practitioners and nurses in the ICU. And again, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, and call out our uh, exceptional and brilliant nurse practitioners, nurses and intensivists who've taken care of these patients day in, day in and day out. We at UFL Health, the Jewish Hospital are blessed to have an exceptional team of intensivists, nurse practitioners and nurses who look after these patients all day, all night, the 24 seven here, and they, they make uh, even the most complicated surgeries go smoothly. So just uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and, and you know, hopefully we'll do many more of these in the future. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Slaughter and Pawa, for your leadership on this project and to all those that had a role in this surgery, the research, our first CARMAP procedure and the care of both of these patients. We'll be taking questions for the medical team in just a few minutes. First, I'd like to acknowledge some other individuals that were key from the leadership team, and I'd like to ask them to come up as I call their name. Mary Marshman, Chief Nurse Executive for Jewish Hospital, Deb Riley, Vice President of Cardiovascular Services. Kim Rallis, Executive Director of U of L Health Traeger Transplant Center. Cheryl Forrester, Director of Cardiovascular Services. And Daniel Roten, uh, manager of our cardiovascular ICU. I believe that Laura, Lauren Hamilton is here to represent her since she is out. Thank you. Everybody. At the beginning of this news conference, I made reference to the significance of Jewish Hospital now being under the ownership of U of L Health. I wanted to give a little more context to that. Since joining U of L Health in 2019, Jewish Hospital transplants are up nearly 40 percent. Our total surgery volume has increased 17 percent, and hospital admissions are also up. And when factoring into our role in the COVID response for the community and the Commonwealth, it emphasizes the important role this hospital and all of U of Health has in this region. Front and center in the effort to put our system together was President Ben DiPuti. Without Neely and the support of the University of Louisville, today would never have been possible. So I'd like to ask Neely to step up and make a few comments. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to ask everybody 
to take one moment. All right, two, just to acknowledge the fact that you are here today, witnessing something that is truly the first of its kind in the world. As we go through life, there are many, many moments, uh, but it's not often that we get to say, I was there when I heard, when I saw, when I witnessed the team that made a miracle possible. It's, uh, I, I, it's, it's really a spectacular day. I'll keep my remarks brief. I want, first of all, uh, to acknowledge that this is the confluence, as you have seen, of what happens when a world-class research university, the University of Louisville, is privileged to bring within its fold an exceptional group of clinicians from UFL Health and combining it with our research. So we put theory and practice to action. And so it's only fitting that Tony Ganzel, uh, Dean of Medicine, as you heard before, Kevin Gardner, who heads up our research enterprise, and Tom Miller are all here today. John, I wanna thank you for stepping up for leadership of Jewish Hospital. You've narrated the many, many firsts that this wonderful institution has had the privilege of bringing into the world. I have to say thank you to Mark and to Siddharth. I want you to know that what you have done means so much to so many people around the world. In case people are wondering, Jill Scoggins gave me this idea that they had to test it on the men first to make sure it was good enough for a woman. Just want you to know. But this is exceptional. It means so much. As you all know, heart disease is the number one killer of women in the United States. And it's the silent, deadly disease that afflicts women and men all over the world. My heart is full today. I am wearing my heart on my sleeve today, or at least on my jacket, because this is a momentous occasion. In addition to thanking everybody who was part of this, I do want to acknowledge the help and the leadership of the governor and leaders of the General Assembly. And I wanna say thank you, as I said, uh, when I think about the General Assembly, uh, Speaker Osborne, President Stivers, Senator McGarvey, Representative Jenkins, this was truly a bipartisan effort to save something that is crucial, not just for Louisville, but for the Commonwealth and the country, and as you see, the world. So I want to acknowledge that. It's hard to believe. And I want to acknowledge Dr. Slaughter, because as I was newbie trying to figure out what we do with all of this, his team and his description, explanation, imploration of why it was vital to preserve these facilities was a very key part in making sure that this day happened. So I want to say thank you. I want everybody here to say that today marks a very special day to know that this is important for Louisville and for Kentucky and for the country and for the world. So could we all please give a huge round of applause to the entire team, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Power, with your characteristic expertise and humility, you recognize that this would not be possible without so many people doing their jobs so well. So could we all please give every one of them a huge round of applause? You can see this is the part that makes them uncomfortable. That's not what they want to see but I mean it. Thank you for everything you do. And I'm so eager for all of you to ask brilliant questions of these brilliant people so we can learn more uh, about why this matters so much. So thank you very, very much, John. Thank you very much, President Bendapudi. As I wrap up here, I wanna make sure that I take time to say thank you to the media, along with all their colleagues for the ongoing support of our healthcare heroes during this pandemic. I gotta tell you that it means more than you'll ever know the support of the folks that are fighting this on the front line day in and day out. So your support has been a godsend to them and thank you for that. We are now gonna open it up for questions uh, for the medical team. We'll take first from the folks in the room here and then watching from the virtual media room, we'll be taking questions there. So we'll start with the folks in the room. Mr. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question was a little bit uh, about the patient and as alluded to is at the moment they uh, uh, prefer to remain anonymous. Uh, but it is a, a very good question, a good point. Uh, as Dr. Powell had alluded to, uh, uh, heart failure in the United States is a very serious problem. There's about 6 million uh, people in the United States with heart failure. Uh, there's about 250,000 deaths per year, but yet we only do about 3,000 heart transplants. So you can imagine then the individuals that at the moment are either not transplant eligible or may never become transplant eligible. They need some alternatives. And certainly, although the LVAD has been a, a huge a benefit to many patients, it still does not meet the need of many of those other individuals. And uh, this patient was typical. That is that they had had uh, heart attacks in the past, blocked coronary arteries. Because of it, the heart had become weak. Uh, she had developed a leaky valve. So several years ago, had undergone a sort of high-risk coronary bypass surgery with valve repair. Uh, she did well for several years. Uh, but as one would anticipate with sort of uh, poor blood flow to the heart, she developed progressive heart failure. So at that point, though, she similarly had developed other organ dysfunction, uh, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, was very debilitated, essentially was bedridden. So at that point, they're no longer at the moment transplant eligible. But if you can get the other end organs to improve kidney, liver, their nutrition, get them to be able to ambulate, they then become transplant eligible. Uh, so in that aspect, so very typical of this group of patients uh, that were trying to meet the need uh, that have advanced heart failure, uh, that have other uh, organ dysfunction that, that don't meet current indications for transplant, but with successful treatment rehabilitation, most likely will become transplant eligible in the future. And certainly a long-term goal, though, of the therapy is that many of these patients uh, will most likely do well for many, many years uh, because we still have a limited number of biologic organs, meaning humans' hearts, that we can do for transplant. Uh, so a typical patient, advanced heart failure, very debilitated, essentially bedridden uh, with uh, other end organ injury. And I say to date is doing extremely well. Talk to us about the recovery from someone. What does that look like for me? Yeah. So I think just the, uh, or as even I try to explain it to patients, but the idea is if you're bedridden and not eating before surgery, you're going to be bedridden and not eating after surgery. So as you can imagine, then the recovery uh, is long uh, because one is they're very weak, their nutrition's not good, and they just have a major operation. Uh, but uh, it's surprising, uh, you know, what people tolerate and what they can recover from. So in this case in particular, a day after the operation, she was off the breathing machine. Uh, today, she's sitting up in bed in a chair. Uh, is going to start eating today. Uh, but the idea is, generally speaking, it's about 10 days in the ICU, sometimes a little bit longer, and then probably another two to three weeks in the hospital, you know, just sort of uh, regaining strength uh, and sort of uh, learning uh, how to manage the device before they would be discharged. Uh, but one of the advantages to this device also is that the patients can go home. Uh, they'll go home, they're ambulatory, uh, they can uh, travel, go places, do things. And the system itself is actually quite easy to manage. Speaking of that, Dr. Slaughter, how does this technology work? How is it implanted? How is it maintained? I see you have the device there in front of you. You want to give us a little bit of... Sure, yeah. about that? that's a that's a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about the technology and the device. Yeah. Before. So uh, the, the the idea though is is that uh, um, you need to sort of replace both sides of the heart uh, so that you can provide adequate uh, blood flow uh, uh, through the lungs to the left side and to the whole body. So for those of you who can see the devices uh, sitting in front, so as you think of it is it has to be about the size uh, of a, a regular heart. 
uh, with con- uh, current LVADs. And uh, years ago, we thought that humans would be okay without a pulse. So many, many patients that have left ventricular assist devices are at home, very active, and they have minimal to no pulse. But it turns out that actually over years, there's a reason why human beings have a pulse. So when you want to develop a pulsatile device, which this is, it also then sort of uh, determines that there has to be a certain size. So the amazing part of this device, though, is it is about the same size as a human heart. Uh, It is pulsatile. It provides the same type of blood pressure, pulse and flow as a normal uh, heart would. And it has a a very sort of sophisticated technology uh, with pressure sensors and ultrasound sensors that actually uh, tell the device exactly where the pumping chamber is, whether it's full, and it actually can react then to exercise and activity. Uh, So it truly is amazing technology. It's very different than anything we've ever used in the past uh, and very closely mimics uh, sort of the human heart and its response to exercise activities and rest. Question I'm not sure maybe Dr. Paul you could address. Uh, how is our, our first patient um, is So our first patient we did about I think four and a half weeks ago. Uh, he's doing really well. Uh, he is is uh, still in the ICU and he's 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 recovered really well. He's strong. He's he's uh, uh, moving about now. He's he's uh, feeding and growing, so to speak. Uh, it's just because, as Dr. Slaughter said, that these patients are really very sick and uh, they've been in heart failure not for days but for actually for years, uh, and so they have prolonged low cardiac output or less blood flow to all their organs. And it just takes a while for all these organs to completely recover and function back at a normal pace. So he's actually doing really well. And I think in the next couple of days, he should be leaving the ICU. And uh, I think uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big success for us to have done it in, in, in a gentleman like him who didn't have many other options. So yeah, I think he's doing fairly well. Tell us what the benefit of this device over the um, artificial heart that was implanted years ago as one of the first ones here. What's the advantage of this heart? Why has it been created? Why are we using this instead of the old one? So uh, two things, I think. One was, of course, that uh, that this this device is self, it can self, uh, uh, the, the amount of blood the, the, the device needs to pump, it can sense, it, it has sensors, so it senses how much blood the, the body needs. You don't have to fix it at a fixed rate. So as, as Dr. Slaughter says, exercise, activity, sleeping, whatever, just depending upon how much the body needs, the device will sense that and pump that much blood flow. That is really unique. And the second thing is, now that we know that it's more compact and it's, it's fitting into... Uh, reasonably, you know, uh, smaller chest cavities of both men and women. That's again, uh, again, a very unique thing about this device. It could just also, though, uh, because I don't want our industry sponsor (laughs) uh, to, uh, the the other unique uh, uh, features are two, though, is one, though, is uh, it has biologic valves. So the previous devices all had mechanical valves that required a significant uh, addition of anticoagulation. And similarly, as the device itself is completely lined with biologic material uh, with a pericardium, uh, whereas the uh, previous devices, whether it's Syncardia or the Abiocor, uh, had a non-biologic interface with blood. So this device so far, uh, actually, there is essentially a zero blood trauma, whereas even with our LVADs, we say some degree of blood injury uh, uh, due to its pumping action and the fact that it still has sort of what I'll just refer to loosely as metal surfaces. This has a biologic uh, surface. Uh, but um, so I say, as Dr. Paula alluded to, uh, very similar, uh, or say action, but the other two also uh, very different than in the past. Can you pick it up and show it to us? Oh, sure. <laughs> So we, uh, it, it's on a, a stand uh, uh, just uh, for a demonstration purposes. Uh, but the idea is the uh, graphs uh, to the pulmonary artery, the aorta, and these two plates ultimately is uh, on the back that you actually uh, attach to the um, uh, atrium. Sorry. 
Would you lift it up or show it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wanted me to see it. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so as, as you can see, uh, it's actually quite compact. As a rule of thumb, the idea is your heart's about the size of your two fists, depending upon how big you are. So if you see, you can hold it up very, very close to the size of a human heart. So these graphs go to the aorta, pulmonary artery, and then on the back is where we attach it actually to the remnant of the recipient's heart, uh, where you sew it into the uh, atrium. Uh, but it's a uniquely compact and it's a... Uh, 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 electronically extremely sophisticated. I would actually use the example of it's very Star Trek like. Mm -hmm. uh, Question. Yep. Uh, I know there have been about oh, 20 of uh, this artificial heart implanted in patients in Europe. Yep. Um, it was obviously developed over there first and then it's now come to the best. How does what has been the prognosis of those patients and how are our two patients compared so far with what, uh, what they've seen in Europe? Yeah. So I, yeah. So I think you always have to be a little bit careful when you're still dealing with small numbers. Uh, because say uh, 20 patients does not sort of represent the general population as a rule of thumb. Uh, but for those patients that were transplant eligible and made it then to transplant, there's an 80% survival rate. So essentially that mimics uh, you know any outcomes uh, even here, say in the United States. Uh, and similar in Europe. So I say the, the uh, initial outcomes are outstanding. Uh, when I speak with the company, uh, what they tell me is the three patients that have been done in the United States, uh, R2 in uh, particular, uh, were sicker than any patients that were done in Europe. <laughs> And similarly, I say it's the first woman and the smallest individual that's ever received the device. So, uh, uh, so far, they're both doing very well. Uh, we anticipate that they will both be leaving the hospital in the near future. Uh, it does look like actually our second patient, uh, the woman uh, may actually even get out of the hospital sooner. Um, but the idea is that the uh, initial results are uh, extremely promising uh, because ultimately, though, you certainly want to try and do their surgery before they have what we call multi-system organ failure. And at the moment, though, and understandably so, uh, you know, you tend to get the patients when they're sicker, you know, for studies like this. Um, but yeah, so the results to date, though, are very good. But I always like to add the caveat, it still is a small number, and so time will tell. Uh, but generally speaking, after studies, the real life experience is as good or better. I mean, this is where Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Paula might get involved. We have uh, Jensen permit too, but the significance of being, you know, the first woman patient, can you address that a little bit? So, what do you think that, that, uh, <clears throat> Well, yeah, and even uh, as a maybe, uh, it may be good, I think, if uh, Dr. Jensen is uh, still on virtually uh, to have him uh, um, uh, comment as well. But uh, as uh, President Bendapudi alluded to, and has always still uh, been a focus of ours over the past few years, uh, and having been an active member of the American Heart Association, as she uh, pointed out, as uh, many women will die of heart disease as men. And as a matter of fact, nowadays, actually more women will die of heart failure than men will. Despite that fact, uh, women only uh, represent about 25% of the patients actually even getting heart surgery. Uh, there are only 20% of the patients getting devices or transplants. So somehow uh, women are markedly underrepresented in getting treatments for advanced heart disease. So up until now, the idea was there was concerns whether or not the device would fit or work in women. And not only was uh, you know she a woman, uh, but it was a redo operation. She'd had previous valve surgery. So I think for the company and just for the population in general, it sends the message though uh, that this technology uh, appears to be safe, it's effective, and certainly it may be a, a very advantageous uh, for uh, women who have advanced heart failure who tend to present late uh, in general, which is say we just don't still understand why they're represent, underrepresented. And I don't know if uh, Dr. Jensen happens to still be on. Uh, he may want to comment as well. 
uh, as to the significance. But we've got to queue up this camera here. And Dr. Jansen joining us from somewhere in France. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can, can you hear me? Well, thanks, Mark, for your, your comments. I can only confirm what you just uh, stated. And I want to add to that that uh, obviously uh, we've done only about 25 patients worldwide so far, but as you experienced, we are going through a quite a steep learning curve. Obviously, in the beginning of the uh, application of this, this new therapy, we are careful in our patient selection. And uh, that's also why the early patients in Europe were, let's say, less sick, but still very advanced in their in the disease process than the uh, the recent patients in the United States and um, I mean, we are very very happy to be working with you and your your team and uh, we've been working together for uh, many decades already in this uh, field and uh, for sure while we uh, expand our experience we uh, we also expand the patient population that could potentially benefit of this uh, therapy as a, as a bridge to cardiac transplant and uh, beyond. So do you have any, any other questions for me? Merci, thank you, Dr. Jensen. Oh, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> You're the president. <laughs> I get it, I get it. Dr. Jesus Neely Bendapudi, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, since the technology is working, I was going to do it before, but you never know with technology. It is such an honor for us to have this collaboration. And this is what it is. These problems are larger than any one individual or any one institution. And we are honored that Dr. Slaughter and, Pau uh, and the whole team get to work with you. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to respond to that. I mean, we're also, uh, I mean, there are many centers in the U.S. who want to participate. We, we want to make sure from our side, we only work Some of this work, uh, and uh, Dr. Jensen can comment as well, though, as you say, uh, uh, we uh, we worked with them, I think, uh, went back and looked, VP, it was 2016. So it literally was just about five years ago uh, when we did some work uh, with uh, Dr. Jansen and CARMAT at the Cardiovascular Innovation Institute uh, to help develop the auto regulation. So these things take time, multiple people, and uh, it's been a, a tremendous opportunity and we really value our relationship with them. And with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. It's been a tremendous opportunity. We wanna thank our team. Well, I just want to wrap up by again thanking Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Powa, and the entire team that has made this happen. I want to thank all of our distinguished guests, including President Ben Deputy, and I want to thank all of you for attending today uh, this great announcement. Thank you. Thank you, John.